Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We've got a game for you today on Sirtis Major EP. This is a 5 versus 5 version, and we've got some fairly high-rated players in here. Hopefully this will be a good game to enjoy. Before we get started here, I've got to send out the request once again. If anybody has any good, solid replays, please send them to me, because I'm always in need of new material to keep these casts coming out to you. Three casts a week, I have to go through a lot of replays to find good games and it is a tremendous help if you guys are sending in replays to me so that I have a little bit more options to sort through while I'm looking for games. All right, let's go ahead and dive in here. We'll introduce the teams and then see where these guys are headed. I don't think this is too terribly long of a game, but I think we'll get a little bit of good action in here. Uh, we've got Stups taking Seraphim. This is Oalis taking Seraphim. Uh, apparently the E-Clan has a pretty high representation here. Bloodier taking UEF in the front slot. Then we do have Jazzy taking Seraphim and Hyena taking Seraphim as well. Good lord, that's a lot of Seraphim. I wonder if this was a randoms matchup. If it was, it wasn't very random. That is the right hand north team, whatever you want to make of it, and every single one of these guys has gone first land, so we'll have to wait for a little bit to see any air units. On the south sides, we've got Badez, he is taking Seraph, or not Seraph, him, Cybran, same as Jal of Lee. I don't know what got into the guys on this latest naming craze, but whatever. It is what it is. Jolly taking Cybern. Then on the front slot, we've got Deponi taking Cybern as well. UEF, the faction of choice for Discoverer 2K4. And last but certainly not least, System Failure taking Aeon in the right-hand slot. It does look like we have a couple of air factories planned for these guys on the south side and a double land over there. Not sure why there's double land going down on the lower portion of the plateau, but whatever. It's, uh, we will just have to see how he makes use of that. This is what I would expect of most of the people on the lower end. If you edge build that factory, you can get your stuff rolling quite a bit faster. You can see there's another one over there, and uh, Bloodier is not going to edge build for his, but we may see that in just a minute. Who knows? Lots of power spam going down one way or the other because there is a ton, a absolute ton of reclaim on this map. You can see all of these rocks scattered around every single one of the cliff faces, both on the lowlands and on the mesas. Then if you can get T1 artillery in here and eliminate those point defense, you can reclaim all of the civilian structures in the middle. Just make sure that you don't fly any T1 bombers over the civilians because there are mobile, not mobile, there are T1 and T2 anti-air. So you don't want to get your air too close in there before that civ base is demolished. I have done that myself once before actually and I felt incredibly stupid because I lost out on a nice little clump of interceptors because they flew over flak. It looks like Stups is going to go for the land spam option. He is getting his ACU out front, and he does have a land factory down on the cliff. Nice little raiding unit over here on the left. That is a Mantis, but it is going to be intercepted by a couple of tanks that are running guard duty for the engineers that are expanding up on the plateau. We do have the air factory down for Oalis, who is going interceptors, yes, and Jolly is going scouts. That's about all the air that we've got, at least for this moment in time. Looks like Bloodier... He is devoting his extra build power, meaning his ACU, to lots and lots of PGENs, which means he's probably planning on early mass extractor upgrades. Yes, he is going for three at once off of the reclaim generated by these engineers, and then that's going to give him the power a little bit later to start dropping ACU upgrades. I imagine that that is the route he's going to be taking. Bloodier seems to be a fairly big fan of tech in most of the games that I have watched him in. I don't think I've ever... Uh, well, I take that back. I have seen him do extensive T1 spam in a game or two, but it's not very often. It's kind of map dependent on what he can get away with. It looks like Hyena is going to be laying down a lot of land factories. He is going to be streaming T1 units towards the other side. Hopefully, System Failure can get some units online. He does have factories planned, but there is a head start over here for Hyena. You guys are ha gonna have to pardon me. I'm fighting off yawns here, and I'm not sure why. Must be uh, sitting still for too long. I don't know. Anyway, on the upper side here, we've got uh, Stubbs. He is getting down a couple of land factories himself, taking advantage of that glorious adjacency bonus there. 
for his factories. We do have a bomber out for Discover, but he is not putting it anywhere quite yet. And we're going to have a mass extractor go down to scout and tank fire. Jazzy is taking the initiative there, getting out in front. Looks like he is going to be able to knock out that engineer over to the side as well. Always annoying when you lose an expansioneer. Lose out on the opportunity for all those mass extractors and whatnot. We've got Jolly out in front. He is placing his ACU directly in the line of fire. You don't need a whole lot of units when you've got two ACUs in a gap that size. Because once you get that much HP and firepower concentrated in one spot, T1 spam honestly does not stand a chance unless you have, you know, a hundred some odd units. Because when you get in those tight lanes, the uh, overcharges are much more effective than they are on an open battlefield. Looks like this factory is going to go down, but that will buy a little bit of time for production to get online over here for system failure. He is building T1 scouts, and that's the thing that I do dearly love to see, because that means that the Aeon, <clears throat> the Aeon Auroras will be at maximum effectiveness kiting these Thams. Hopefully he can handle them very, very well, because he has a lot of tanks descending on his position, and not a whole lot of Auroras to stop them. He will, well, yeah, if the tanks just kind of chill out right there, uh, that will lead to some unnecessary deaths from the long range fire. T1 bombers coming in from Discover. That is doing a very nice job of softening up these targets. There was one tank killed up there and a couple down here and those guys are going to go into full retreat to be cut off by those Auroras. So if we can get an engineer over here to regain those three mass extractors then there will be a fair little chunk of reclaim and system failure can get back on his feet and up there on the scoreboard. At this exact moment he is a little bit behind his direct opponent the ACU is moving out to the front, and I think that's a good thing because we do have an ACU right here that is uh, possibly going to push a little bit. We'll just have to see what happens. Looks like Bloodier is moving into the middle. He has got T2 on his ACU, that early upgrade, well, early-ish, six minutes, and we've got huge banks of T1 mobile artillery for both sides moving in. Pony is going to be getting into the middle, biting into that reclaim as quickly as he can. That is going to give him enormous numbers, and he's overflowing to his team as well. That is, that is a huge help to everybody on that side, and he is just about going to power stall from the huge amount of mass that he has been reclaiming. Not a bad problem to have, if you ask me. If, you, if at all possible, you want to stay away from that power stall, but hey, if you got too much mass, that's a good problem to have. T2 point defense going down for Bloodier. That is going to try to force all of these units back. Unfortunately, the ACU is right there to start laying down fire. It's going to force a stop on construction, but good lord, shedding half the health on that commander. Lobo shots doing some 400 plus damage, I think. They used to do 600 per shot, but I can't remember what they were rebalanced to. It's between four and 500, if I'm not totally mistaken. Either way, they pack a sickening punch, and you do not want to be catching that fire with your commander. Some artillery raining down on, that is, Hyena's commander, but he is able to push up with his superior number of tanks. That is a problem, though. He is not quite complete on that upgrade. He's going to take quite a few Oblivion shots before he can get that commander upgrade online. Jolly and Badez in a very strong position here. They've got an equal number of units to those of Stups, and we're getting a commander upgrade here. 34 in the hole on a T1 commander. That is probably Stealth. Maybe? Or resource allocation. Let's say it's resource allocation and go with that. We'll see if he drops T3 air in just a minute, then it was definitely resource allocation. We will check back in just a moment. 7,000 health left on that commander. He is going to get the hell out of Dodge. Those Oblivion Torch is going to knock out a little bit of that expansion. So nice little cliff build there. It uh, might be good to reclaim those, actually, because I don't think they're going to be doing much good from here on out. But that ACU is going to start forward point defense in order to try to shove that ACU back just a little bit. Point defense going down for the Seraphim side as well. Have to see how that point defense war develops in the next couple of minutes. Bloodier has got a shield down with a P-Gen, a couple of anti-air. He is now relatively snipe proof. He's going to be throwing down a T2 power generator to provide the power that he needs for all of these T2 mass extractors that he's got running. 
a whopping 61 mass per tick, which is close to the top of the line. Looks like Jolly is matching about 59. We'll check in Reclaim in just a second after I glance around this battlefield and make sure that there's nothing huge going on. There's a drop. Looks like he's missing out on a couple of tanks, but he's taking a relatively full load. Nope, coming back. Let's go ahead and rip down the reclaim numbers real quickly here. Uh, Bloatier with 12,000. Jolly sitting on 11, just about the same there. Pony on 9. Then we've got 5 with an aggressive power stall. 9, <laughs> 5, and moving on down the scoreboard. 7s and 8s and 7s. Okay, so not, well... Jazzy is pretty low there, 2,000. But there's a fairly significant amount of reclaim for just about everyone involved. On this side, we have a pretty good number of T1 tanks. We've got one Ilshiva and one Mobile Flax. That's a nice little battle grouping protected by the advanced interceptors of Hyena. He is fronting for those transports and directly engaging the air. So it's also going to be difficult for bombers to deal with that situation. Up on the north side... Looks like we've still got an upgrade going down. That is going to be T2 for Bedez, and that is going to start being a little bit of a hairy situation there. That was resource allocation for Jolly, by the way. Jolly getting down the TMD and probably needs to do something to assist that teammate because all of that is about to be lost. Down here, we've got a Corsair dropping several of those T1 tanks. The Ilshiva is stunned from that AM T1 bomber. Aeon brutal pronunciation error there and uh, one mass extractor down there's a lot of t1 bombers hovering around but that flak will be able to make short work of the majority of those here comes a corsair will he pull the snipe there it is no more flak unprotected units those should be fairly easy to deal with now so not as bad a loss as, as it could be excellent reaction from the team and jolly sending over that t2 air unit in order to lend a helping hand to his teammates Looks like air has been regained by the Southside team. We've got three ASF online, and that is a strap bomber, I think. Yes, Jolly building a strap bomber. We've got no T3 air on the north side. The upgrade has begun, but there is very little build power on that, so it's going to be a little bit before we see any T3 air. ACU directly engaging those units. T1 bombers, T1 point defense all working together to rid the earth of the ilsh of a plague and there it goes the south side is safe once again two mass extractors down and a little bit of build power but nothing too terrible so right now this is still relative stalemate seen a lot of little plays around the outside edges many many things going on but for the moment at least it seems like these guys are relatively well matched with almost exactly 50-50 map control. Here comes a strap bomber though. This could potentially change things. This is a little bit of a bummer because Jolly is cyber and that means no one strike deaths for T2 mechs. You can see it's going to survive with 250 HP because of the low damage on that bomber. But what he does lack in damage, he gains an area of effect. You can see the huge damage potential of those bombs knocking out all of that build power. Bomber going to hover around just a little bit too long, letting all of those interceptors get in range ASF. There are six, seven now for Jolly. Those are going to move up to the north probably to try to save that strap bombers. But... And T1 Bombers attempting a shot at the T2 P-Gens. Doesn't look like it's going to make it, though. If that Stroud Bomber comes down, he can plant a bomb right in between those and kill both of them in one pass. I think that'd be about the best possible option for Jolly to hit. There's the bomb. It's a long reach, but I think that's what it is. Yes, both P-Gens down for poor old Jazzy getting the raw end of that stick. Strap Bomber getting off one final bomb before it goes down and eliminating about half the build power on that factory. Oh, Alice, he's got the T3 tech, he's got the power, but he just doesn't have the build power to get T3 air online, and that is a bummer. No! Badez is down! T2 point defense. I get the feeling that that was probably a misclick. He probably... <laughs> misclicks OP. He walked out too far with that commander, wandered into the lethal embrace of Seraphim T2 point defense, the highest damage dealers that there are, 
And, well, I don't know. The Aeon may be on par with it. Anyway, brutal point defense. And that commander is going to go down, leaving Jolly's side wide open. There is a disadvantage and an advantage to this. The advantage is that Jolly is going to get all of this reclaim and four or five more mexes under his belt. The disadvantage is that he's now actually going to have to do something about the left side where before he had his teammate flying cover. There is another strap bomber out. Taking out a couple of those point defense and a little bit of other stuff. But we've got three ASF now online for Oalis. Nothing that can contest air control, but plenty to drop a strat bomber. All right, teammates stealing in on <laughs> Jolly's mass, dropping off six engineers there to start aggressively reclaiming. That, mm, yeah. See, Technically, when someone dies, any reclaim anywhere on the map is fair game. But in this kind of situation, I would almost argue that you should leave that reclaim alone <clears throat> because you are on the right side. If you're building air or building something that can uh, generally help the entire team, then, sni then snagging reclaim is no big deal. Like if I'm playing Navy on Settings, I have no problem with the air player jumping in my ocean and getting reclaim because they're probably going to put that mass to good use. However, if you are a uh, if you are next to someone who outranks you by almost a thousand, who is now going to have to cover his lane minus one person, I'd almost say that you need to just leave that reclaim alone because if he can get that mass, it's going to put him in a much better position to defend that side. If somebody stole my mass in that situation, I would expect them to help me eradicate the pests that are bothering my border. It looks like system failure is going to be in a little bit of a mess. Sorry guys if I'm creeping up on the mic, not paying too much attention there. Hopefully there wasn't too much static. The Oblivion turrets are awesome for raw DPS, but when you're versus a bunch of T1 units, they struggle with that low firing rate. And yeah, they are going to be able to win this, I think. Crazy overcharge there if you saw the, the uh, twirly cue. Um, but not without losing most of that fire base. So that's uh, Seraphim ACU is going to get forced back. He's not going to be able to hold that aggressive stance, but he did do a lot of damage. However, the reclaim is next to system failure, so system should be able to snap all of that up. Bloodier has pushed his fire base up, and he has now got T3 artillery within reach of the base. That's going to start pounding away at the build power and economy of Discoverer. Is that Discoverer? No, that is Depony. My bad, two pink players. Monkey Lord straddling an ASF there. Squish. <laughs> well, it, it actually does look like a squashed bug with the, uh, with the wings poking out. All right, there's a Monkey Lord online. First T4 of the game. And this is actually mildly concerning. Because I don't think these guys have it scouted. Maybe they do. Yes, they do. Never mind. That scout is just close enough to wing the edge of that monkey lord as it passes. That is going to move up here. And if Bloodier is not careful, he does not have enough in his base to deny a monkey lord. This could be a little bit of a sketchy situation for him. Although this forward fire base is a tremendous asset. You can see the reach on this T2 artillery. He can touch three bases. That is going to, well that has the potential of doing a ton of damage. Depends on if this monkey lord takes it out or not. That is the question here. Can they stop it? There's T2 units on the left hand side. That, uh, that's pretty much going to be veterancy food for that Monkey Lord. And on the right, we've got just about the same stalemate we had a few minutes ago before all of those units were lost. System failure, again, though, snapping up all of that reclaim. That is going to be a beautiful bonus for his base. All right, the Monkey Lord is breaking left a little bit, just enough to drive all those units around to that side. And then as that Monkey Lord, well, it's walking towards the cliff. Which way are you going to go there, bud? He is swinging far north as he can in order to avoid any intel coming in. Make him think he's going left as much as he can so that that ACU does not move. Let's take a look at the intel. What does the vision look like? He does have it scouted. Is there? Nope. T1 Air Scouts pinging across. 
It's exactly what you want to do in this kind of situation where you can't keep tabs on a stealth unit. That ACU is going to back the hell up just like you'd expect it to. And the Monkey Lord is going to tear into that base. There's three Ravagers online which do a tremendous amount of damage but uh, not quite enough. There's a T2 transport. Bloodier is making his way to it. If that Monkey Lord hadn't stopped walking, I think Bloodier would be dead at the moment. And he's walking back to load up. No. Don't do that. That's weird. Did the ASU get stuck? What the hell? There we go. That was weird. <laughs> Monkey Lord very nearly sniping that commander, but not quite. And I'm also not sure why Jolly didn't snatch that T2 transport. Because uh, with Bloatier on board, even if he lost 100% of his ASF, he probably would have taken a significant portion of Oalysis as well, and he would have eliminated the strongest player on the opposing team. I think that would have been a fair trade for a handful of ASF. But that was a missed opportunity. We will forgive him for it and move on with this battle. So many T1 artillery. This is the strength of the Zooey, folks. Um, those things are going to be able to move in, dealing tremendous amounts of damage. And there's so many individual targets that the T2 point defense cannot drive them back. So that's going to be a total loss of this firebase. The gun commander is going to be able to move up and deal with the couple of harbingers that were in the area along with any T2 tanks. That is a T2 gun nano regen ACU. Tough bastard to kill. Not going to go anywhere anytime soon. ASF coming in for a direct engagement. Jolly not picking up super fast. I think I can still pull out an air win there, but the strap bombers are going after that exposed commander down to 200 health. Immediately starting to build a shield. That is the right call in that situation, but he's lost almost all of his ASF. Get that shield online. Start another ACU in the shield. Here comes the bombs. One was caught by a collision with an air unit. Two connecting. Death to the shield. Oh, no. Was that... An air crash? I think that was an air crash that killed that shield. I'm not 100% sure though. There weren't any units nearby and if a strap bomber had hit it would have impacted the ACU as well. That was odd. I'm not 100% sure what killed that shield. Had it stayed alive, Jolly would have survived that. But uh, yeah, three strap bombers taking out an ACU. Not a fun time at all. That leaves three strats winging around the base. No T3 air to deny. We do have T3 air building for Discover, but he doesn't, well, he has one single ASF up. Oh, man. That was a hard loss. I think that is actually going to wrap it for the Southern team. They had so much stuff going for them. They had that Monkey Lord up, which could have easily crushed the left-hand side or gone to the south and gotten this whole mess taken care of. They had finally pushed Bloatier out of the middle. Uh, stuff like that is incredibly frustrating because you get right up on the edge of recovering a situation and then it all just falls apart in front of you because of one mistake. I can't put my finger on exactly what that was. Maybe a little bit of a lack of scouting, not realizing that all of those strap bombers were right there. Maybe not positioning the air quite correctly. Definitely that ACU being a little too far away from home, not under shields, etc. in the advanced T3 air stage. But whatever it was, Jolly is down, and that leaves the north side to go on a rampage. I will say, nice recovery from the early death. South team was doing very, very well, but there's not really a whole lot you can do to recover from that unless you uh, unless you have a telemazer on hand or something. Looks like T3 tanks are going to score the kill on Pony. And on the south side, same thing for system failure. All of those units closing in. Bam! And system getting nailed. 
Looks like uh, the middle is going to take a little bit longer to fall. We were starting on a fat boy there. But it is going to fall nonetheless. Straw Bomber's coming in for that kill on System Failure. All right. This is one thing I really don't appreciate much. This whole thing, Bloodier to, uh, or Jolly to Bloodier, rather. System Failure, I think he did reasonably well. Um, he was at a little bit of a faction disadvantage as far as the Firebase Wars and all that goes. Um... I think he did all right. He did end up collapsing in the end, but he held for a good long time. That is going to be a win for the north side. Salty as all hell, typical of the higher ranked games. But you know what? It was a good game nonetheless. Got to see, <laughs> got to see a couple of odd little things. Alrighty, guys. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please send me your replays, and I will see you in the next one.